This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. In forensic audits, the auditor or accountant is seeking to find uh, facts and evidence uh, that would be useful in respect of financial and legal disputes uh, and perhaps tracking down other irregularities. Often it means there's going to be a court case, it could be civil or criminal. Uh, not always, however. Uh, insurance companies can ask for reports about uh, losses made if, say, the warehouse were to flood or a theft uh, was made from the warehouse. Uh, they will want some sort of independent report uh, uh, estimating the value of the goods stolen uh, before they're willing to, to pay out. Examples are uh, fraud, uh, negligence, so if uh, an accountant is maybe negligent in the report which is uh, produced, uh, someone is claiming damages, uh, there has to be some sort of estimate of what those damages would be uh, before the court is likely to, to award them. Insurance claims, as we've said, like uh, fire, theft, uh, money laundering uh, could be uh, part of our remit. We think there's money laundering, we tell the authorities, the authorities then want us to maybe come and to estimate uh, how much money came from uh, illegal sources and was maybe mixed in, blended with legitimate sources. And uh, matrimonial disputes. Husband and wife are splitting. Uh, the husband, let's say, has a lot of property but begins trying to hide that, hide his wealth from, from the wife. Uh, even though the court is trying to say, you know, should pay whatever percentage it is uh, uh, across, and the husband attempts to uh, evade those legal responsibilities. It's important in forensic uh, uh, audits, forensic work, to remember uh, ethics. In particular, there is maybe a threat from self-review. You are brought in to... Uh, uh, calculate how much has been lost in a fraud uh, and you are also the auditor uh, and you feel kind of uh, embarrassed uh, about the amount that maybe has been uh, uh, lost uh, and you know you should have found it and you're kind of reviewing your own work uh, you may be less critical than you should be about that similarly it means self-interest kind of crosses into that as well you don't want to uh, uh, admit, if you like, that you made a, a, a serious error in the uh, audit and that's uh, maybe how the fraud happened or how the fraud went undetected for some years. We have to think of our competence and due care. Do we have the specialist competence uh, that is needed to carry on a forensic audit? If we're called to uh, give evidence in, in court, uh, do we have the, the right training that allows us to give evidence in a convincing way, but without overstating it. It is not the purpose of the auditor to become the advocate, another uh, uh, potential threat to the ethical principles. Uh, you have to give the truth as far as you can calculate it or estimate it. You are not one-sided in this. The, the, the court is a place where you attempt to find the truth of what's gone on. It's up to the uh, solicitors and barristers maybe to be one-sided about it, uh, to promote the honesty of their client and to uh, reduce the uh, incidence of the crime that they're accused of committing. Uh, but the accountant has to be impartial and mustn't drift into advocacy. Non-standard uh, items, uh, or effectively the, the, the engagement is a non-standard review. It is not like a, a traditional, normal, pretty standardized uh, review of financial statements or audit of financial statements. These are very much once-off. The frauds could, could be big or bad. Uh, they, they, they could have been going on for maybe three months, three years. Uh, we don't know how much is involved in that. We don't know how many people are involved in it and so on. We don't quite know uh, what the client wants us to uh, report on, uh, perhaps. And so we have to be absolutely clear 
uh, to get the terms of engagement uh, and to lay down in kind of black and white uh, what the accountant is going to do for the client, what the client expects from the accountant, when they want the reports sent in, will the accountant be expected to give evidence in court, uh, and so on. So if you don't set out the terms of the engagement at the start, it becomes very, very messy later on if one or the other party uh, feels they are being let down. We, uh, as accountants or auditors, uh, are often expected to act as expert witnesses in court. And as I said, we are not acting as the exclusive and the exclusive interest of those who pay us. Our duty is to help the court to reach the truth. Uh, and also there's a danger in maybe overstating our case, overstating our evidence. Uh, remember, there are going to be solicitors on both sides. Uh, if someone's accused of fraud, uh, and you maybe overstate your case against that person, uh, maybe about how much they defrauded or when they defrauded it, uh, and you do that without the, the right evidence yourself, and this person's defence lawyer comes in and says, well, surely that must be wrong because that person wasn't employed then, uh, or, or the, the, you're surely overstating the amount of uh, cash that was stolen. Once there's a little uh, a little kind of chink, a little doubt in what you said as an accountant, uh, then a lot of your credibility just goes. It should also be said, uh, the same will go for your working papers. These are being held up to scrutiny. They are going to be picked over by the opposing solicitors. They're going to be looking for any flaw, uh, any schedule which doesn't make sense or which uh, appears to be done in a sloppy way, anything like that will give them the route into attacking your credibility and weakening the case. So the documentation must be absolutely precise and superb. You have to be really, really careful not to be uh, really induced into overstating what you know. If you don't know it, say you don't know it, rather than making it up or rather than you know exaggerating slightly you should give only uh, independent uh, opinions on matters which is within your expertise so if you're an auditor and you very, know very little about tax uh, then you shouldn't be giving uh, information or opinions about the, the 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 tax liabilities or the tax amount which has been defrauded the, again the uh, solicitors will soon uh, I'll pick your case there and you'll be uh, ridiculed really by the court. You have to state if your opinion is uh, provisional or qualified or more information is required or whether you're pretty kind of certain about it and so on. And it's also very important that you meet the deadlines uh, set by the court. A huge number of people are involved in court cases. Uh, the judge, the, uh, the, uh, the, the clerks of the court, uh, the various solicitors on each side, uh, maybe lots of witnesses have been called in and they're kind of waiting to give evidence and so on. And if you uh, uh, kind of appear uh, and say, well, I haven't finished my work yet, then kind of all of these people have wasted their time. They're going to have to be sent home uh, and you will not be popular with uh, the judge. Difference in approaches uh, that are, are going to be maybe particularly relevant Materiality. And I think we've, we've talked about this before. Uh, if you're dealing with ordinary transactions or a company is dealing with ordinary purchase transactions, it might set a, a kind of authority limit of $200 or something. And it's only going to get uh, full authorization from managers for orders or transactions, maybe over $200. If the fraudster knows this, then the fraudster could be doing many transactions at like $190, just sneaking under the uh, the bar, really, of full authorization, full controls. And so maybe what we should be looking for are relatively small transactions, but a lot of them. And this, and again, I think we've mentioned this, where CAT can come in, computer-assisted order techniques. You can set up the order program to search through 100% 
let's say, of payments, looking for particular account numbers of payees, looking for uh, uh, particular uh, uh, names of payees and uh, the like. Uh, and you can very quickly find and compile lists of all the monies, even small amounts going to uh, particular destinations. Uh, and you may know that that destination is a destination uh, account of the person who you suspect of the fraud. Timing is much less predictable. Uh, you're liable to be called in at short notice. Again, it impinges on uh, uh, your capabilities and your competence. Uh, there's a fire in a warehouse. Uh, the insurance company wants the report quickly. The client wants the uh, uh, compensation quickly and so on. So suddenly you have this job that comes out of the blue, uh, interrupting with your normal work and your normal client's expectations. Or a fraud has been discovered, uh, and, and suddenly it's kind of you know, everyone to the pumps, really, to, to try and find out how it's done, stop it, assess the amount, see who's been involved. So before we say yes to it, we have to make sure that we have got the people free, we have the right number of people, we have the competence in due care, and it's not going to damage the work we're doing and expect it to do for our existing clients. Documentation, as I said, is very critical. It has to be absolutely perfect if it's going to be uh, uh, put in front of the court and, and clever lawyers and so on, whose job it is really to pick holes in your documentation, what you're saying, what your conclusions are. And finally, you have to be very uh, careful uh, if you are going to be thinking of questioning uh, suspects. Uh, it's a skilled matter, is questioning suspects, to try and uh, get them to uh, trip up, if you like, and what they're saying, of, of, of putting facts to them in, in a straight, not any sort of uh, um, aggressive way, but just putting facts to them and saying, you know, so tell me what that payment is for, and, and why was that payment made, and why did it go to that account, uh, and the like. And you have to be very, very careful uh, that you don't, say, start accusing uh, people of uh, a fraud, uh, where if they are in fact innocent, you may have laid yourself open to uh, actions of defamation, because these people could claim that you have damaged their uh, character and their standing in the firm and, uh, and, and so on. You also, at some point, need to see if the police have been involved, uh, you may have to liaise with what they have uh, done. Uh, you, if they are questioning suspects, there's in a way no point in you doing it and so on. Uh, if the police have been involved, then of course the chances are that you are going to be, uh, perhaps, and, and your findings are going to be taken to a criminal court. Uh, some companies, of course, prefer not to do that. They don't like the bad publicity that comes from having to admit to a fraud. Uh, and it all being laid bare in a public court of law, they would rather handle it quietly. Uh, and if uh, someone is found or admits the fraud, uh, for example, uh, they, the employer might rather kind of get rid of them, say, you know, go now, uh, and we won't report you to the police. And I'm afraid sometimes uh, employers are so keen to get rid of uh, fraudulent employees, they even give them a good reference so there's no problem getting a job somewhere else, where no doubt they will just repeat their exercise in committing fraud.